So um, welcome everybody and to our final presentation. It's good to see the team together and thank our partners from Downtown Women's Center. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are gonna allow the students to present out for their presentation for about 35 to 40 minutes. And then we'll reserve the remainder of the time for Q&A from our partners. And for those of uh, you that are on with us virtually, welcome. It's wonderful to have you all. Uh, as well as one of our students who has an ailing back and so Tharav is going to do his best to present um, uh, via Zoom, and that'll work out just fine. I understand we have it all in place. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to the team and enjoy your presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly, and I'm a sophomore majoring in political science. And first of all, I just want to welcome Downtown Women's Center back to USC, and thank you guys for giving us this project. Um, I think I can speak for our whole team and say that you know, we really learned a lot, and we became really passionate about this. Uh, topic. So we're really excited to show you guys our findings for this semester. So the research question we focused on in our project is how can Downtown's Women's Center better assist the unaccompanied women population in Los Angeles? And in order to present our findings, we're going to start with providing some background about policy prevention shortcomings um, and then move into some comparative analysis on best practices and case studies in relevant successful regions followed by some rehabilitation services for incar formerly incarcerated women, and finally end with um, some survey results and policy recommendations that we prepare. So to start off with an issue as complex as homelessness, we'd like to talk about some historical context and background about why prevention policy in LA County has um, faced many shortcomings. And so I found about four main issues that I'd like to focus on. And first of all, the first issue I'd like to talk about is the historical invisibility of unaccompanied women. Simply identifying as an unaccompanied woman is a major barrier to access for homeless shelters, healthcare, job training, and mental health counseling. Now, unaccompanied women are the population who do not have children or any dependents um, under their name. And so because they don't have children, this is a major issue and they are the, historically the population most likely to face the positive feedback loop of you know, being victims of domestic violence, um, any uh, efforts to extract themselves from such situations leads to economic disenfranchisement, um, substance abuse, incarceration, um, more mental health illnesses, and finally homelessness. And this is kind of a positive feedback loop that unaccompanied women are facing. And to address the economic disenfranchisement part of that um, equation, we have the GAIN program, which is a job assistance program that allows for vocational assessments job training and other job related expenses. But a caveat to that is that in order to be um, eligible for GAIN is that you have to be part of the CalWORKs program, which is a public assistance cash program, only eligible for families with children. So once again, um, unaccompanied women who have no children are not um, eligible for such services. Another issue I'd like to talk about is especially relevant in the course of the pandemic, which is telehealth, inaccessibility, and unavailability. And again, unaccompanied women are most um, affected by this telehealth inaccessibility because they are the highest, they are the population likely to face highest rates of mental health and illness. So actually in 2020, LA County did a study into telehealth accessibility and some of the findings that they discovered were um, technological illiteracy, outdated technology, lack of cell data, and most importantly, um, most clients found a lack of trust and a lack of privacy when accessing telehealth. Uh, specifically lower income, uh, lower income Latinx communities, black communities, and Asian communities were the least likely to receive services in a language and format that they were most comfortable with. And because of all these issues, um, they were least likely to access telehealth when they needed it most. And LA County did not have any concrete conclusions. They just said they would further evaluate the need for more telehealth assistance. Um, one suggestion they did give was uh, the creation of more community spaces designated for telehealth, but as of now, they really do not have any concrete plans for the future. Now, shifting away from healthcare, I'd kind of like to talk about the housing industrial complex. So in Los Angeles, 75% um, of land is zoned for single family housing, as you can see in the or dark orange colors in this graphic. And 50% of LA residents are renters. 50% of those res renters spend 50% of their income on housing. And just to put that into context, the federal definition for unaffordable housing is if you spend over a third of your income on housing. Now, a good example would be Berkeley um, and Sacramento, and they were the first two cities in the state to ban single family housing, which would allow for a lot more housing units to be built 
Um, LA hasn't quite made that move yet, but we do have transit-oriented communities, which is, which is a project that would allow for a lot more added units to be added to existing housing near major transportation hubs. So kind of moving along with uh, projects that increase housing, um, the fourth issue I'd like to talk about is the lack of accountability and um, the, yeah, the lack of accountability of governmental policies such as SB 8, 9, and 10, Measure H, and J. So here in this graphic, you can see a Measure H progress tracker. And um, just as an aside, I'd like to note that a lot of this, although this tracker exists, a lot of LA County websites uh, that have information about Measure H, their progress trackers either end at 2019 or their graphics have been privated or deleted which is really concerning because um, the public just doesn't know what's going on with the current status of these um, measures. So here in this graphic, you can see the dark blue represents the funding and progress made um, directly from Measure H. And you can see this kind of imbalance where Measure H is not really providing the majority of that, and the light blue is where other sources come in. And that's where I kind of think organizations like Downtown Women's Center have a great opportunity to kind of assist um, in the gaps. So I know Downtown's Women's Center was kind of looking into um, future housing construction projects. So I took a look at the Reimagine LA Design Challenge, which was started by the mayor's office earlier this year. And this is one of the winning designs from that housing design project. Um, this one is a fourplex, which is financially the most uh, feasible uh, type of construction for alternative housing. And this one, um, although it was made for families in mind, as you can see there are some that are for a single with a dog, um, two parents with a child. I think this construction plan is still very relevant for unaccompanied women who would like to live with other women, and it would foster a great sense of community and interpersonal relationships. Um, another great thing about this fourplex design is that it allows flexibility for women with changing spatial needs over time. So if a woman um, in the future decides that she would like to live with a partner or somebody else, then she can go ahead and purchase one of the units that most fits her needs at that time. This is another winning design from that challenge, and this one kind of straddles uh, the, the space between a community center and alternative housing. So here you can see there's different spaces that are designated for different kinds of topics, such as community spaces, work from home spaces, which we realize is really important from the pandemic, as well as telehealth spaces designated for um, telehealth communication. And this kind of community center alternative housing um, uh, blend will allow for flexibility among women with different needs at different times, and also allows for a great sense of fostering of community. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is policy advocacy, which I also know Downtown Women's Center is interested in getting more involved with. Um, currently, there is a lawsuit um, attacking SB 10 that claims that you know, governments can are being allowed to overturn local zoning ordinances that locals were voting for, which makes this unconstitutional. And I think it would be a great idea for Downtown Women's Center to get involved with this lawsuit. There's this really ex uh, successful example in 2019 in Huntington Beach when a similar lawsuit happened. And an organization called California Association of Realtors got involved and wrote an amicus brief. And they were really successful in protecting that. So I think that's definitely something that Downtown Women's Center could get involved with. There's also the Build Back Better plan, which provides $330 billion in affordable housing funding, um, improvements to public housing, and rental assistance. So I think lobbying or getting very involved with interest groups that are lobbying towards supporting this plan would be very beneficial in the coming years for Downtown Women's Center. And on the topic of policy advocacy, I'd like to pass it to Michelle, who will be talking more about that. Hi, so I'm Michelle, I'm a sophomore majoring in political science, and I'm gonna be talking about the direct service and prevention. So first I wanna reaffirm the importance of designated um, unaccompanied women as a subpopulation within the unhoused um, communities in Los Angeles. So designating unaccompanied women as a subpopulation would mean that more federal funding would be allotted to this population, allowing for more direct services that directly tackle their needs. So unaccompanied women are a large and growing population within the un unhoused community in Los Angeles. Unaccompanied women make up 40% of all unhoused individual Californians, 44% of all unaccompanied women in the United States live in California, and unaccompanied women make up nearly 65% of all unhoused women in Los Angeles. So recognizing unaccompanied women as a designated subpopulation will allow this group the necessary funding and um, direct services in order to best address their individual needs. So the further marginalized a group is, the fewer services that they will receive. For example, 
In Los Angeles, there are only 16 beds made available to unhoused transgender women, despite this group being the most directly targeted for domestic violence or abuse. So, although there's legislators like um, Supervisors Hilda Solis and Catherine Barger who have pushed for um, legislation that will designate uh, unaccompanied women as a subpopulation in Los Angeles. Mayor Eric Garcetti and City Council President Mary Martinez have directly spoken against doing so. They are against funding commissions or reports that directly tackle the needs of unaccompanied women, saying that doing so would be like a waste of time essentially. However, through the research and the next four studies, I will show that there is empirical evidence that um, supports the need for a subpopulation designation. So these are the four studies that I focus on. It's the Santa Clara County Survey of Homeless Adults in Northern California, the Los Angeles County Course of Homelessness Study, the St. Louis Study, and the Study of Alameda County Homeless Residents. So, um, all four of these studies found that unaccompanied women have more apparent personal and social vulnerabilities, making them more vulnerable to future episodes of homelessness. And the data also shows that unaccompanied women are a target population for focused psychiatric interventions and psychiatric care. So this graph shows three of the studies, data from three of the studies, and the dark bar on the left, it represents unaccompanied women. So this graph shows the rates of recent psychiatric hospitalizations as found in these groups. And as you can see, in unaccompanied women, that rate is much higher than the others. All four studies confirm that unaccompanied women are poorer and have higher rates of mental illnesses than their other counterparts. And they require a, a different set of direct services to tackle their need, namely mental health services, healthcare, vocational services, versus women with children who may require things like parenting training, life skills, and child care. Okay, so despite there being differences of methodology within these four studies, the conclusions and data were shockingly similar. All four studies found that unaccompanied women experienced the lowest annual income, they were unhoused for the longest period of time, they have the highest rates of mental disorders, namely schizophrenia and major depressive disorder, and they have the highest rates of substance abuse, whether this is chronic or recent, alcohol dependence or other drug dependence. And despite many of these uh, unaccompanied women recognizing their need for mental health, only 40% of them were able to receive it, showing that a lack of recognition is not the main barrier to receiving psychiatric help. So many unaccompanied women have difficulty meeting basic needs because of a scarcity or inadequacy of existing direct services that could be tackled through a subpopulation designation that would allow them more federal funding. So, unaccompanied women have been basically ignored by politicians despite them, despite them having a population that's greater than unhoused veterans and unaccompanied youth combined. So this is a good example of a way that federal funding can be used to support direct services for a group. Unaccompanied youth as a subpopulation that designation have allowed them a lot more services that have greatly supported them. The McKinney Bench of Homelessness Assistant Act was created to support students assisting homelessness and this has been incredibly successful at targeting the unique needs of this subpopulation. It has allowed for federal funding for tutors or other academic supports for the students, basic school supplies, transportation to and from school and extracurricular activities, and specialized training and professional development for teachers and other school employees. So a subpopulation designation clearly shows that it will bring increased awareness, research, tailored programs, and specific funding streams, which all play a major role in reducing and preventing homelessness. So historically invisible to politicians, unaccompanied women have largely fallen through the, um, the cracks, but a subpopulation designation, as you can see, is very necessary to provide the necessary direct services and preventative measures for this group. And then I'll pass it to Patrick, who's talking about the best practices. Hi, yeah, so I'm Patrick Oslin. I'm a political science major, and I'm a sophomore here at USC. And I will be discussing the best practices in general policy making for dealing with um, the unhoused issue in general. And so the, basically, the way Atharva and I, who's the next person presenting, decided to go about this is that I will be addressing the overall policies that have seen in cities to be helpful for the general homeless population. And then we think this 
combined with the reconciliation, like reconciling this with a more effective direct service program, would be the most helpful in helping. Would be the most helpful in dealing with these issues. So, firstly, I like to go directly into my first case study, which is the city of Chicago, and they have a comprehensive seven-point plan. And while not all of these um, apply specifically to unhoused women, as as we know, like it's not really a nationally designated group. I think all of them do have points that are able to be applied to this issue. So firstly, the crisis response system. Um, this is just basic homeless prevention. Being able to identify when or being able to provide resources for when a family or a particular woman right, is at risk of becoming homelessness, at, at risk of becoming unhoused. Um, this makes the effort to address that before it becomes a larger problem and either move them to affordable, stable housing or be able to address any issues that they're currently experiencing in their households, such as financial instability, domestic violence, mental illness, etc. Um, two is a commitment to access for stable and affordable housing for everyone. Right? So these are the projects that, cities, that the city is taking on in order to just build stable and affordable housing, as Kelly was talking about, um, and just providing that access and having houses that people can actually afford can help to alleviate the issue. Um, youth homelessness, this is something that I think is not necessarily like concerned with unhoused women, but the way they go about this I think is very important. And it is an effort to create a comprehensive, developmentally appropriate menu of youth-oriented homelessness services, right? And as we'll see, like, how they've been able to reduce um, homelessness in their city, it is very important to recognize, like, the effectiveness of providing specific menus of services for specific populations. For example, um, a lot in a lot of cities, and as we said, like, since they're not officially designated, pub women's health for unhoused women, like women's specific health, is very hard to come by. And so providing resources that are specifically catered to that would definitely be uh, helpful. Five is civic engagement, and this is more of a cultural outreach, where um, trying to kind of like destigmatize homelessness and involve the public more in helping to address it, such as like, not addressing like homelessness, but like having to move towards like a culture of like these are unhoused neighbors, <coughs> correct? Um, cross system integration is similar to advocacy and system um, and civic engagement, and to where they try to combine public and private systems of care, right? So um, like smaller grassroots groups along with like larger federal or state or city level groups, right? In order to create and kind of coordinating between those different levels in order to create a more comprehensive plan that is more effective. And the last is improving this capacity building, and this is like making a big effort to improve logistics and having shelter available at homeless shelters, but also having the ability to fully carry through service, such as like reducing turnover rates among staff and making sure that when um, a resident has been able to exit permanent housing, that there are still resources available to them in the case of crisis, which brings us back to the first point, right? So, this does seem to work. Um, this policy was started in 2012, I believe, and they've adapted it every couple years with proper supports and updates. And um, 2012 is not necessarily an accurate number because they did not include the count of the unhoused population this year. But if you can see, like after a slight spike, they've been able to achieve, at 2019, the lowest recorded amounts of homelessness in the last 14 years. So I think, um, especially uh, driving home the point that like developmentally appropriate menu is one of the most important like to institute in a policy. Which brings us to Utah, which um, the reason I chose Utah in addition to Chicago is because in Utah, it's a bit different, um, homelessness in general, just because uh, since it is a smaller population, and more like chronic and generational, like even generational homelessness was on the rise for a bit before they addressed this due to some housing reconstructing, pro reconstructing projects 
in like the 80s had like these repercussions. And so what I want to get across here is that these, um, Utah recognized unhoused women as a specific population and open health centers um, in Salt Lake City for this specific reason. And this is just another example of being able to like provide permanent housing in addition to services is the best way to allow somebody to be able to be successful on their own. And the main focus is on rapid rehousing programs, firstly, right? Such as like providing permanent housing, providing free services, and being able to have an environment where residents are allowed to thrive. And again, like they secured they secure $27 million over three years, increased access to primary care, yeah. And so the results I wanna look at are, if you can see, this graph shows like a slight decline, um, but I think the more compelling one is this one right here, which kind of relates in proportion, uh, home, like homelessness in Utah versus homelessness in the US in general, right? And if you look, like it's an exponential graph, so like these numbers are like bigger than they, are further separated than they seem. Um, and the one I specifically want to look at, and I think like, is the most compelling, is the black bar on the right, which is unsheltered, chronically homeless individuals. And if you can see, like, compared to the U.S., right, all, all the way up until 2016, during these policies that have been implemented, that are specific to Housing First and, like we discussed in Chicago, really like catering, like getting a, organizing with unhoused women and finding out what services are needed and providing an appropriate menu of services to um, that would be helpful. You know, it works. And in 2016, they've been able to have less than half, right, proportionally, of um, chronic, unsheltered, chronically homeless individuals. And now I will pass it off to uh, my colleague, Atharva, who, like I said, will be discussing the best direct practice, best practices in direct um, service. Hi everyone, um, my name is Fargo, and I am a junior in global studies in journalism. And want to apologize first for not being that in person because I just have some. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, very okay. great. Yep, yep. Yeah, so last minute health issues affecting my mobility. So I'm gonna, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Whoever has the right there. So, I focused on ideas of cultural competency and responsiveness and how they can be used to um, optimize the direct services that we provide provided to the unhoused population. So I'm going to start by first of all defining cultural competence and responsiveness. Cultural competence is the ability of systems to provide the activations with diverse set of values, beliefs, and behaviors, including daily um, delivery to meet patients' social, cultural, and linguistic needs. Cultural responsiveness uh, involves the active process of seeking to accommodate the service to the client's cultural context, values, and needs. The rationale for this is not only to ensure appropriate and effective service provision, but also to the practical effect of the goals of substantial equality and justice. So those are the definitions. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, as seen by uh, in a study in the Journal of Community Mental Health, um, the lack of cultural responsive and inclusive practices um, within uh, the practitioners who were serving the unhoused population resulted in the underutilization of services. And this study was actually done in Southern California. But, um, and it also also showed that um, when um, culturally sensitive and inclusive practices were introduced, um, the utilization actually increased. And some of the things that the study mentioned was the language, ethnic, and racial match with therapists and clients, and also the location of the services within the communities that these organizations were trying to serve. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So at the very core of it um, is the issue that the very idea of home differs from culture to culture. Some cultures emphasize healthy relationships with family and friends, physical and mental health and well-being. So strong cultural ties and self-determination is a part of that collective idea of home. So there is also a really pressing need to acknowledge and tackle the spiritual and social homelessness that many unhoused folks feel because they come from communities that have been in the receiving end of intergenerational trauma and centuries of dispossession, marginalization, and colonial theft. 
And it's also just really important to incorporate cultural responses, culturally responsive practices, because that is a vital disparity in the socioeconomic status of the practitioners who are seeking to serve announced populations and the actual announced population themselves. Can I have the next slide, please? So I looked at two case studies that I thought were doing really good jobs at um, including incorporating culturally responsive practices in their permanent supportive housing programs. And both of these will actually be from Canada because um, their provinces um, have generally accepted, as Patrick said, that housing first works. And now there's sort of a step ahead of us trying to figure out how they can um, incorporate a lot of other things within their permanent supportive housing programs, um, including culturally responsive practices. So one of the first things, uh, the first case study is the Kootenai Watch in Alberta. Um, it's focused on Aboriginal homelessness. And uh, the first thing that they do is when the clients come in, they make sure to uh, assess people's spiritual needs in the intake surveys that they fill out. The staff there is also more than happy to support um, any sort of cultural activities and any ways in which the, the clients there want to remain in touch with their families and communities that they come from, which include like traveling or just writing to them or any medium of communication. There is a lot of cultural programming within the lodge, but again, um, none, of the, none of it is mandatory. It's uh, very much voluntary because um, they want to restore people's sense of agency, which I'll talk a bit about later. Um, there is also um, a lot of heavy focus on uh, hiring from within the communities that they're serving because the lodge thinks that uh, it makes for a more empathetic and welcoming environment. Um, and those staff members are actually able to better understand and empathize with their clients. Um, also, another big thing was the house, at the housing facilities work as an actual house. So the staff is there to support the population, the, the residents in any way that they want. But um, the residents are more than welcome to just go in the pantry and the kitchen and make their own food because, again, they want to restore people's agency because, as we know, homelessness as an experience can take away from a person's individuality and agency. So that is a lot of focus on that. And overall, just very less programming. Nothing is mandatory because uh, a lot of the other programs that you see with organizations, they will uh, pile on a lot of um, things that you have to do if you want to be in a permanent supportive housing program or um, just receive any supportive services. Um, can I have the next slide, please? The, the next one that I have is my aunt's place, uh, that's also in Canada. Um, so uh, the first thing that they really emphasize is that they incorporate elders in the communities that they're seeking to serve, and so those elders can not only act as guiding hands for um, for not, not just the residents there, but also the staff, and help the staff just understand and emphasize a lot better with the residents. And uh, because the turnover rate for volunteers and organizations like these is really high, so they want to make sure the frequency at which they're uh, conducting their trauma and trauma practice care trainings um, are really high at least um, bi weekly or monthly because a lot of the times volunteers will get trained and then leave within a month or two, and the people who are there are not trained, so they want to avoid that by conducting regular trainings. There is also no necessary disclosure uh, for women, the, the women do not, do not have to disclose their reasons for being unhoused uh, because um, it can lead to pre traumatization because a lot of these women are coming in to this uh, place, they come from communities that have been um, historically buried of social workers because the information that has been gathered by social workers has been historically weaponized against them. So they do not have to disclose their reasons for being unhoused or why they're there in the first place. Um, and the last thing is that my, at my aunt's place, recidivism was never seen as a point of weakness, but it was also it was seen as a strength. So if a uh, resident relapses or um, they get into a fight with other members of, for some reason they have to leave and they choose to come back, they'll never be turned away uh, because uh, the staff there thinks that women can actually improve and should not be turned away because of past missteps. And now that's it for me. Now I'll hand it over to Dea. Thank you, Atharva. My name is Taya Heisel and I'm a junior double majoring in philosophy, politics, and law and global studies. And I'll be talking about the intersections with incarceration and also with infant partner violence and its, their effects on um, women experiencing houselessness. So to start, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of some national trends when it comes to incarceration. So this chart shows how many people, um, I don't know if you can see the title there, but it's um, people experiencing homelessness who have faced incarceration and the rates at which 
those who experience incarceration face homelessness. So you can tell the general trends is that women are more likely to be unhoused if they've been incarcerated than men. Um, people of color are more likely to be incarcerated, are more likely to be experiencing homelessness after being incarcerated. Um, older people uh, and people that have been incarcerated more than once are more likely to be experiencing homelessness. And then time since release also, um, the closer you are to your time of release, um, the more likely you are to be unhoused as well. So just to focus in a little bit on um, gender, as you can see, of course, women of color are the most targeted when it comes to um, experiencing homelessness after experiencing incarceration. So that's just a general national overview. To get into more specifics within California and Los Angeles, 70% of unsheltered people um, have been incarcerated at least once, and 56% of unsheltered people um, have been incarcerated at least once in Los Angeles. Um, these people are most likely to be incarcerated because of nonviolent offenses. So that's offenses related to being unhoused, like existing outside, sleeping in the park, all that jazz. And it's also um, more likely to be related to drugs. So I just wanted to point that out, especially because there's this myth that uh, people who are unhoused are in some way violent or are prone to, to committing crimes. That is not the case. Um, when they are criminalized in a city like Los Angeles, they become incarcerated. Um, also, the, so two times, uh, women of color who are, they are two times more likely than men of color to be incarcerated, and white women are, two, are more than two times more likely to be incarcerated than white men. I'm sorry, <laughs> if you are formerly incarcerated, you're two times more likely to experience homelessness as a black woman compared to a black man, um, and more than two times a white man compared to, or a white woman compared to a white man. Um, so it is women that are targeted more than men. Um, and of course, trans women and women of color are, are the most targeted. And this is also has deep ties to intimate partner violence. So 79% of women who have been in prison have experienced um, sexual abuse, sexual assault, or intimate partner violence. Which brings me to my next topic of intimate partner violence. So you can see that over 60% of women in prisons have reported past sexual abuse. Over 90% of homeless women have experienced severe violence or sexual assault at some point in their lives. Um, that's nationwide. That's compared to a national average of the general population. Um, that's one in five women. So it's severely more for women who are unhoused. They're way more likely to have experienced sexual violence or abuse in their past. And also, I really want to talk about the COVID-19 impacts because with every crisis, there's an increase in intimate partner violence. Um, there have been studies that show that for a long time, and the studies are not necessarily all out now because of COVID, because we're still in it. Um, so there's still research being done on this, but so far, um, studies have found that um, there have been higher rates of emergency calls because of intimate partner violence. There's been a reduction in access to services, and there's even an increase in femicide worldwide, so more women are being murdered um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So as time goes on and as research um, gets developed even more, we're probably going to be finding that intimate partner violence overall has increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think this is a really important thing to consider when um, looking into the assessment that's coming up, um, seeing how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted women who are unhoused, how that's impacted um, if they have experienced intimate partner violence. This also reiterates the importance of housing first that involves trauma-informed care, um, and also housing first for women who are victims of intimate partner violence. Um, they require different services, health services, mental health services, um, maybe privacy and special circumstances that they would require. So having um, housing that is targeted towards um, victims of intimate partner violence is incredibly important in any work that Deaf Women Center can do to advocate for that. So that brings me to my recommendations. AB 328 is a bill introduced by Assembly Member Choi. Yep, Zach, Zach knows about it already. Um, so the hearing was delayed in May, but it was introduced in January of 2021, and it's a bill that redirects funds from the closing of prisons into um, support services and reentry. So advocating for that, which I'm guessing from Zach's enthusiastic nodding is something that they're doing, amazing. Um, so we're on the same page there. So that's a really, really important bill. Also, targeting advocacy in general for reentry for women who have faced incarceration, um, and advocating for women facing incarceration for policy change and services. So basically, anything the Downtown Women's Center can do to break the cycle, there's this incredible and very severe cycle between 
intimate partner violence, becoming incarcerated, and experiencing houselessness, if any time that an organization like Downtown Women's Center can bring a woman out of that cycle at any point, um, that would be incredibly helpful, and that's whether through policy change, through direct service, um, anything you guys can do. So I'll now turn it over to Sophie, who's gonna talk about um, our survey. Hi, my name is Sophie. I'm a junior studying political science, and I was actually able to go to Downtown Women's Center and conduct some surveys. Um, we asked nine questions to the clients and 10 questions um, to the staff. And um, after finishing up those surveys, I received a total of 20 responses from the clients and six responses from the staff. So then I took um, three questions from each survey that I thought were most important and then I consolidated my findings. So first I'm gonna start off with our client responses. So one of the questions was, what is the main or biggest challenge you face every day? And 55% of women had an answer relating to services such as transportation, the difficulty of accessing services like housing or getting help fighting employment, and medical services. 25% um, of answers were related to mental health. Some of the women telling me they were dealing with mental illness such as anxiety. 50% um, of answers were miscellaneous. The women were dealing with their own personal matters and 5% did not respond. And then moving on to our second question, um, what resources have been the hardest for you to find in LA? 45% had a housing related answer. They mentioned that qualifying for housing was really difficult since it's based off of a point scale. Another woman mentioned that it was really difficult for her to find housing specifically for seniors. 25% um, of answers were medical related. Um, some of the women were seeking eye doctors, dentists, or specific kinds of doctors. 20% um, um, of answers were miscellaneous. Um, some answers including looking for support groups, food and employment. And one woman even mentioned that it was really difficult to get a hold of local politicians. And then 10% of um, <laughs> clients did not respond. And then finally, our third question, is there anything else you would want us or anyone else to know? And um, one woman, actually two women, responded with um, that there should be more trash cans, especially in the Skid Row area. And then another woman mentioned that there should be a hotline for women who are housed in um, shelters or other city, state, or federal housing to register verbal and physical abuse. All right, now moving on to our staff responses. So, first question was, what is a new program area you think would benefit downtown Women's Center participants? One staff member answered with a street outreach program to reach the most vulnerable, unsheltered women in the Skid Row area. Another answer was related to peer support, which apparently has benefited a lot of case managers and helping uh, their clients to thrive and kind of bring new perspectives to the table. And then a third answer was an advocacy program. Uh, the next question was, what obstacles to expanding, improving, or maintaining program services have you seen or experienced in your time at Downtown Women's Center? Um, one staff responded with better and frequent data collection on program outcomes and participant experiences. Um, another answer was related to technical improvements with teaching women how to navigate useful online, online platforms, and then finally funding, especially for the housing programs. And then our third question, what do you personally see as the future for a downtown women's center? Um, one response was developing more permanent supportive housing and scaling knowledge to help other groups and develop um, developers interested in population specific permanent supportive housing. Another response was more outreach and networking through peer support speakers and specialists. And then another answer was downtown women's center services and programs expanding to other cities outside of LA. And then finally, just passing more bills and policies to end women's homelessness. And finally, we have a re recommendations um, to better support unaccompanied women. So our first recommendation is to participate in local housing lawsuits such as SB 10 and um, participate in federal lobbying. Um, our second recommendation is that unaccompanied women should be designated as a distinct subgroup to better support their needs. 
Our third recommendation is to incorporate cultural inclusivity in your Housing First programs. Um, our fourth recommendation is to support AB 328 and advocate for formerly incarcerated women. And finally, our fifth recommendation is to consider developing a hotline for women in federal housing to register verbal and physical abuse. And that is our presentation. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. Very good. Good job, team. You all take a deep breath, Matt. You did a great job. Excellent. So um, we've got our remaining time to take questions from the partners, and I'd like to make this a little bit more relaxed, so you can all just sort of uh, you know, chill out there. Would you rather them have take a seat at the table, perhaps? If you guys want to sit down, please. How about you guys sit down and it makes a little bit more uh, comfortable? Pull chairs around, and we can sort of sort of hear you playing some here, or maybe over here. Maybe over here. Maybe over here. And then we'll go ahead and um, and start our discussion. Yeah. Okay, firing squad, yeah. uh, how about it? Yeah. Whoever would like to start. Well, I'm not your professor, but I just want to say y'all rocked the absolute heck out of that. <laughs> that was just so incredibly exhaustive, and it's just so clear the amount of work and time and just the volume of information that all of you took in. So I just want to say such an incredible job. And Atharva, just the fact that you were able to give such an exhaustive and thoughtful presentation <coughs> while sitting in bed with a back issue is like, is also just, insane so just thank you so much for your presentation i hope your back feels better and that's just no no not only how appreciated that is but just how like actually extraordinary is just what you did so really really want to kind of uplift that um interesting wow so much to cover i was really fascinated kelly and michelle also when we were talking about I found so much of the discussions of the inaccessibility or the fact that women's mental health needs are being unattended to. I was curious if in any of that data there was sort of, if you were able to sort of kind of looking based on sort of also Tharva's comments around cultural competency and responsiveness, if there were, if we were able to disaggregate any of that gender or any of that data by um, both gender and race, because we see that this also goes actually back to, and I can't wait to talk about incarceration because there's so much there um, in a moment. But uh, we know that black women so like make up roughly nine or, or by demographic subgroups in Los Angeles County on like homelessness, like black women sort of track the most disproportionate. Uh, so if they're roughly eight percent of the population and make up about thirty-three to forty percent of unhoused women. Just really curious if we saw if there was any way to sort of track with the lack of mental health service provision um, by sort of by sort of gender and or by race and ethnicity. Um, so the studies that I found didn't talk about the mental health services a lot, but it did talk about the disparities in like um, how like the how many ep episodes of homelessness you have and like your group income yeah. based off of race, yeah. which definitely would have an impact on mental health. And as you can probably guess, like black and brown, like women of color have lower rates of income and increased rates of like having more frequent episodes of homelessness and like returning back to being unhoused. I'll also just note that like there's a recent California policy lab talking again, going back to cultural competence and responsiveness mm -hmm. of the California policy lab showing that it is disproportionately black Americans or black Californians are more likely to experience race or recidivism from permanent supportive housing. So once they've made it all the way out of homelessness, they are falling back into homelessness at higher rates. So that's just everything that y'all found really tracks with that. Patrick, I was curious when you were looking at just kind of your thoughts, and Utah, as your research indicated, like show that really is the pioneer of housing first. Um, it is, though, when you look at the numbers of homeless, I, I'm curious, if it, this is a question of scale, because like Chicago, the stats were like 6,700 unhoused going down um, at its peak. We know that there's 21,000 unhoused women in LA County of that roughly 13,500 are unaccompanied women. I'm just curious if kind of, as you're sort of thinking about these best practices, if, do you have any sort of comments on like the challenges of scale? Yeah, so um, like we were saying, a lot of, uh, I'm not, see, I'm not really sure how like much it would apply. I'm sure obviously like, while there is a greater scale in Los Angeles, 
there's also a much higher like income and availability of like resources, right? When it comes to like mental health and money and um, just things related to like providing a service. Um, I think with Utah, it was kind of different because like uh, they homeless there homelessness there seems to be a lot more of a chronic and generational symptom. At least that was the issue on the study I was reading. That that is. Um, what like specifically like prompted them to do uh, just permanent supportive housing because it's generational, you know, it's like multiple generations are being homeless. And so I'm not really sure how scale would apply to that. I mean, like it's a hypothetical, but I personally, um, with what I see, like I think LA definitely has the resources to do it, um, especially with like the amount of money that goes to the LAPD and stuff. Uh, yeah, so I don't think, I think it's more of a question of like policy and like how far willing people are willing to go, right, to like sacrifice certain parts of like the city that may not be necessary in order to help like this particular area. Because I think it's there, like I think the possibility, like the financial um, resources are definitely there, but. I know, I know y'all are deep in the midst of sort of finals week, but I, I don't know if sort of the last few days of this week, LA Times has come out with a, a poll that was done by the LA, that the LA Times did in concert with the LA uh, Business Council. And it was, there were some really interesting findings. Post, you can even look at this post from post finals, yeah, yeah. and we'll, we'll circulate, but some, there, it is this question of billions and billions of dollars have gone into the system in the last five years, and people outwardly see that, I mean, like, unsheltered homelessness has gotten worse, and not only has unsheltered homelessness gotten worse, total homelessness has increased, I want to say, by like 50, like 40% in like the last seven years. So homelessness in general is getting worse, and people are like, where's the money going? Well, I thought we said, we passed HHH, we thought that was going to be better. We passed, we passed Measure H, we thought that was going to improve things. And the problem is that Measure H, over the last three years, we have actually housed 66,000 people in LA County, but 90,000 people experienced homelessness in LA in 2020. So it's a question like, this is something that policymakers, particularly as measure age, because it was a 10 year, uh, it was a 10 year ballot measure or sales tax increase, as that's gonna be coming off the books in a couple years, people are like, how do we make the case to voters again that like, we need, we actually need the continuation of funds and we maybe even need more money. Zach, I wonder, um, Otsi has actually raised her hand. I will stop talking. Uh, no, no, you're good. I'm going to just get her in so I don't forget. Um, is it Otsi, if you're uh, online or if you can hear us, I understand you have a question. I want to say I have been involved first as a reporter for the LA Times and then as a board member at the DMC, at the DMC in covering uh, many, many phases of homelessness uh, among women. And uh, when I began writing about the Downtown Women's Center in 1982, there were 400 women living on Skid Row, and we were all outraged. And at that stage, the women were not allowed uh, bathroom facilities at the Midnight Mission or the Union Mission or anything like that. So the first part of the DWC was just a big rented space where firemen and policemen and synagogues and churches had volunteers who cooked once a day for 100 of each one of them. I think this presentation is so important. I learned so much from listening to you all that I'm going to ask that you will allow the DWC to use it as an educational tool for uh, uh, volunteers, for donors, and for the board. I think it's a, a huge step forward. I especially want to, to comment on the question of in in formerly incarcerated women. Uh, the one thing I I want to point out, though, is that I believe that we have so many women who are on the street because of physical abuse, uh, bad relationship, leave the apartment, leave the house, leave the mobile home, live in their car, lose the car, lose the job, and so much of it goes back to domestic violence. But uh, I want to commend everybody. Again, I am an enormous amount. I do think that the size, and I want to go back to that one point, of uh, solutions here have got to be gigantic, but they have to be done in small increments. When you cannot store 600 formerly homeless people in one residence, I mean, you need to have residences, I believe, that are somewhere between 150 
175, 125, 90 women, so that you can have a couple staff there. I will tell you that when the first downtown women's center residence opened, there were two women that they're quite pleasant. I don't know, did anybody see the rooms, the individual, the individual small studio apartments? They're quite pleasant, and, but there were two women who for many months would not sleep in their bed because they didn't want to get used to a bed in case they were back on the street again and they had to remember how to sleep on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. wow. Tells you a lot. I, this is Bob Strong. I, I just want to say this was a spectacular presentation. That it was it was one of the best I've seen, or maybe the best I've seen. And I also should tell you that one of these new residences that the downtown women's center is opening is called Oatsy's Place. It's out yeah. in San Fernando Valley, and I think will house 16 to 80 women. Uh, but what a great job you folks did. Yeah, you're remarkable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you both for chiming in. I really appreciate it. I know it means a lot to the students. Great. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to uh, Zach and Camina. Got one yeah. more, one more quick thing, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, so sure, one go ahead. Yeah, I think, just so one, your work on incarceration and homelessness is just incredible. Uh, and so DWC has actually already signed on to resupport AB 328. So that's something. But we've also actually, what's incredible about this is that over the last couple months, we've been actually working at this nexus. And I'm going to actually steal some of your stats. Um, but uh, in Elson, we so, just consider it borrowing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if, so now we know that like 64, based on the loss of stats of 2019, we know that 64%. So LA County has the second largest unhoused population in the country behind uh, New York, but we have the largest unhoused, unsheltered population. And so of that, 64% of LA County's unsheltered population has carceral, is, has experienced carceral systems. And so we're actually, we've been working, we've actually, we're working to develop a, with Hoppix, we've pitched uh, two county supervisors' offices and we've just recently pitched the jail closure implementation team to create a jail in reach program designed for unhoused women, domestic violence survivors, and mothers to try and ensure that there's an unbroken line of service provision for women as they're engaging carceral systems and have a specific jail in reach at CRDF, the women's prison. So everything you said, like this is, this is, this, yes, this is just incredibly powerful. And it is of the way in which that there's that double sort of gender racial inequity that's disproportionately harming black women cycling through these, and they're more or less, and this is where, frankly, LA County needs to move, is recognizing that the decarceral, or the carceral population and the unhoused population is two-thirds the same. I just wanted to, I just wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll stop talking. No, no, um, well, just to echo what everyone said, um, this was like, hugely informative and amazing to see everything that you pulled together, like truly just a mammoth foundation of knowledge and statistics, some of which like I haven't seen. It sounds like Zach like is finding them useful too, so huge props. Um, and a really difficult year, so well done. Um, I actually have some questions about the research process um, myself, because I find that's usually like really like a good way to get started thinking about like future directions. Like, hearing about the experience and thinking about it. So I was wondering like, if there were any particularly like sticky areas for you guys that were difficult to get into. I know we had two kind of check-ins with you throughout the semester, but what, I mean, we're talking about barriers to access. Like what did you kind of, what was your experience just like getting into the weeds with this? Yeah. Just kind of to anyone. Something that I think Taya was talking about was like a lot of the like studies and reports on like unhoused women in particular were like, almost exclusively from you guys, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, because this is not a nationally recognized thing. So I think um, finding things that are like relevant to that were really difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of to continue on that, especially when it comes to intimate partner violence, like you guys really spearheaded the information on that. Um, so trying to find other statistics that might help you do better, like you guys are already doing so much, I think that was really hard for me to find. So I tried to just focus on like what's new with COVID and um, things you know that would be helpful because y'all already know so much <laughs> and you do such amazing work already so 
Yeah, and I guess adding on to the COVID stuff, I mentioned earlier that like a lot, on a lot of the LA County um, websites that talk about housing, um, a lot of their graphics, their accountability trackers are just gone. And I think at some point, because some of them end at 2019, so I think we do need to kind of take COVID into consideration about how that may have affected the current construction projects. Um, but at the same time, I think the fact that a lot of them are gone or deleted or private, it makes me really wonder what is the reason why. Because actually, there was one website that I looked at a month ago, and it was there. And then I looked at it again uh, in the last two weeks or so, and then it was gone. So it makes me wonder, you know, what are the things that are happening in the background that we as the public are not aware of that are causing these things to be removed and kind of hidden from public view? So that's something I found. Yeah, I mean, I actually, I really appreciate how kind of like reflexive your presentation was, and I think in the research process, like that's like so important to be questioning, like what am I not finding, and like why might the question, or why might that be, and so like how can we create something to at least like you know, start to address that. Um, but I kind of wanted to, I'm so sorry, I have a hard time with names. Um, I wanted to, how, how you got into, like, pick specifically the intersection of incarceration. Was it something that, like, we brought in the presentations or just something that came up kind of organically? I know you all split up the research early on, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that yeah. was... So that was actually something I originally didn't start researching this topic at all. Yeah. Like it's something I've been super passionate about and super aware of for a while, but it wasn't where I wanted to start my research for you guys. But I ended up going to this event that reminded me of, you know, all the county ordinances that make it illegal to sleep outside. And like that kind of stuff really riles me up. Um, I get really upset about it. So I kind of went down a bit of a research rabbit hole on that. Um, and then when we met for our midterm exchange, I brought that up and I remember you guys said like that's something you're really interested in shaping mm -hmm. policy advocacy around. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm just going to go with that okay. and um, focus the rest of my research on that. So I'm, I'm glad it was helpful. Um, but generally, it's just something I've been interested in for a long time. And I'm glad that you guys were interested in it as well because I got to explore that even more. Yeah, it's super timely. Um, I think kind of so my like my main thought about this is that like when you started speaking threads from everything that all of you really started coming together in a way that I think like the um, parameters of like a semester long research project like when you have so many other classes as an undergrad like you know you're doing what you can with the time you have within these parameters a lot of you are probably coming out on like your senior year it sounds like which I know you have a lot of like thesis opportunities internships um, I feel like you've created this like foundation here for a really potentially like I think we think very interesting research project like honing in specifically on this intersection because kind of going back to like the threads of like disproportionate um, like women experiencing disproportionately um, mental illness especially if they're unaccompanied um, how policy failures around that just they're going to disproportionately affect the people who are disproportionately um, experiencing them housing models that can like you know start to address this bring in the cultural competency which like as a former anthropologist in training I was just like yes um, like this idea of spiritual homelessness and like every kind of like revolving around this intersection and like recommendations that you can bring into that that's kind of like what really started and so I think like like there's so much here and I think this was like a really interesting process to be like okay like this is how you know we can start to like see one area where like there is movement and like you contributed something that's kind of like started to I don't know at least for me I was like okay there's all this background and like it opened my eyes a little bit um and so I'm like not trying to sign any more work but I think like <laughs> I personally would love to see another project come out of this like kind of getting into the weeds specifically with that um, because, yeah, I mean, as I said, like, everything really came to the fore and even, like, reshaping survey questions, like, with our, because I don't know off the top of my head, like, what percentage of the women that we serve have experienced incarceration or been just as involved. Um, so these are all, like, you might know because you've been working. Oh, so there's actually great, there's a huge amount of stigma around that. Actually, yeah. uh, so this is something that's come from our work that's just really interesting. So. We were able to pull about four and a half years worth of HMIS data. So HMIS being the homeless management intake system. So anytime that's part of the coordinated entry system. So sort of as when you're input into the system, there's a series of questions you're asked. So we were able to look at about four and a half years worth of data about nearly 950 women 
and 49% said that they engaged with the police officer either as a witness, a victim, or an alleged perpetrator. 46% said that they were engaging in risky behaviors like solicitation or drug running that could expose them to more uh, kind of partial interactions. And 36% said that they had ongoing legal issues that could result in a loss of housing, loss of employment, or incarceration. But only 13% said that they actually had been incarcerated for more than a night, which really, which our program staff sort of really opined that there is a huge stigma around people talking about their experiences in the carceral system for fear of either like losing access to services or once again winding back up in sort of carceral systems. So this is. This is, there's a massive, like, so the data is, is always an undercount, particularly when, like, self-reported, yeah. because for fear of, like, getting themselves in more trouble. Um, I'm super curious just for all of you, of, like, what was, was there anything that surprised you? Just anything in sort of, if you came in as you were sort of going through just, again, these reams and reams of data and reports and studies, if there was anything either that you just had an expectation of something or there was just sort of stats that you were just like, oh, dear God, that really sort of, like, this did not match up with my pre-existing expectation, or just I, for whatever reason, like I did, would have never thought of that. Or it could all have been sufficiently depressing, and this is exactly <laughs> what you thought, and that's also completely fine. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we all pretty much knew like the general expectations. Like, of course, women of color are going to be more targeted. Yeah. Of course, trans women are going to be more targeted. Yeah. Like, things like that. Like. Yeah, we, it wasn't really a surprise. Um, I think finding the exact numbers, again, wasn't surprising, but I think it's important to know. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. But. Yeah, um, one thing, uh, you guys mentioned a survey once, like a survey that the LA County uses. It's called like the VIS dot. Like, the, uh, oh, VIS for that. Yeah, the yeah, VIS for that. Yeah, yeah I, I was like, um, that, it was just, it, it was something small. Like I, I read it and I was like, I don't really want to like, like use this, right, yeah. I don't think. But, um, it did surprise me because I was like, oh, this is, like, I thought this was something used in the 80s. And it's like, oh, no, they're using it, like, right now. And, like, I was surprised at how much, like, seemed like incriminating information that they were asking you. And, I mean, I can just, like, imagine the interaction, like, where it's, like, somebody comes up to you, takes your, wants to take your picture, asks for your social security number, and then, like, starts asking about, like, you know, drugs, violence, like, what's your deal, you know? Yeah, it seems like not particularly helpful when trying to find like <coughs> services and especially when it's just like a score and it's like oh well you know you got seven points not eight so you're not eligible for housing yeah it seems kind of like that that seemed pretty ludicrous to me the rest was sufficiently depressing though okay <laughs> chill chill sophie i wonder um having done your survey down in the downtown women's center if there's anything that you either sort of repetitively heard over and over again what would you say is the one sort of takeaway uh, from from any of the surveys that, that you received? Anything that really resonated with you? Um, honestly, a lot of the women were really like happy with the services you guys provide. And See, were, so that's pleasant. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Good to know. yeah, they were like really thankful and they even mentioned, like I would say majority of the women mentioned that they were so thankful for it. Um, it was so interesting to hear a lot of their stories. Um, I think, I guess the one thing, um, I don't know, it's so hard to just pick one thing, but I, what was kind of interesting to me is the fact that they wanted more trash cans like in the Skid Row area. I never like really thought of that. So I think just that in general, and I don't know, just hearing their stories were, were, was really nice, so yeah. Great, thank you. Any last questions? No? Um, well, I was curious what's a 27 million figure over three years. It was like on a Utah. Graph. Oh, yeah. That, 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 was, that was, I think, in Salt Lake City specifically. Was um, it money saved or was it? No, it was, it was money yeah. like that. Sorry if I wasn't clear about that. Okay. It was money that the city like provided, like put aside specifically for like permanent supportive housing mm -hmm. and like services and stuff like that. Like it was just like a lot. It was just 27 million. 27 million. I, yeah, I don't know. Is that a big amount? <laughs> so just just for, for, for reference, Patrick, a, a measure H, the budget for the last fiscal year was four hundred and fifty four million. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In LA County. Yeah. I mean so yeah. So yeah. Again, I think that kind of brings up the scale thing where a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's crazy. Half a billion. Yep. Right. Well I would like to thank both of 
you all for all of your efforts in helping the team. I think you all did a splendid job. So maybe we can give a round of applause for our, our research team. We will be, uh, they're turning in their final uh, policy papers to me on Monday. And after I churn and burn through them, we'll pass those along as well as the bank of slides um, yeah, in our stream to you and all. And like more excited that you have, especially for some Exactly. Yeah, we'll be giving all of it to you. So we just thank you for your time. We know how, uh, how busy you all are, but we appreciate what you do. Thank you for working with us. Oh, picture, yes.